Hi, good morning, everyone. We're going to give it a moment to allow folks to enter into the meeting from the lobby. Welcome. My name is Michelle Cunningham, Marketing and Outreach at the Healthcare Workforce Development. We are excited that you have joined us today. Before we begin, I would like to discuss a few housekeeping items. The webinar will be recorded and posted on our webpage. The chat option is open. We will entertain those questions in the chat during the Q&A session, which is at the end of this webinar. In addition, during the question and answer session, your mics will be enabled and you will be able to raise your hand to ask questions. Starting off, I'm thrilled to introduce our presenter, David Winston, Program Officer with the Healthcare Workforce Development. Thank you, David. Thanks so much, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is David. I'm going to be your Program Officer for FNP PA programs, as well as our newly added midwifery programs. I'd like to also introduce uh, my colleague, Crystal Flores, who is the uh, former FNPPA uh, program officer, um, and she's going to be helping as well um, with any questions um, since she has a lot of familiarity with the subject. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm looking forward to working with all of you and looking forward to uh, having some uh, doing some incredible work with with the grants that we're pursuing. So uh, with that, uh, I can go ahead and get started with the presentation. So um, first, I'd like to give you some background about Song Brown. Uh, it provides funding for education programs, uh, both, um, as I'm sure you know, for family nurse practitioner and physician assistant training programs, uh, registered nurse education programs, uh, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN residency programs, and uh, just recently, licensed midwifery and certified nursing midwifery training programs. Uh, Songground also provides financial incentives to programs to uh, first graduate individuals who practice in medically underserved areas, enroll members of underrepresented groups in medicine to the program, and locate the program's main training site in a medically underserved area. Uh, and finally, to operate a main training site at which the majority of the patients are Medi-Cal recipients. So I just wanted to make sure you uh, are aware of all of our application dates. As I'm sure you know, um, the application is uh, now open and you're uh, able to apply. Um, some of you might have already started your applications. Others might start after um, this presentation but um, wanted you to also know that we now have an early submission review date, which is August 16th. And what this means is if you do submit your application by this date, then you'll have the added bonus of, of your program officer, myself, going through your application, seeing if there are any issues, any um, discrepancies or mistakes that I can then uh, get it back to you and have you make all the necessary changes before the final application deadline. Uh, now, if you are unable to submit the application before August 16th, uh, unfortunately, there, there won't be any uh, application review. So uh, it's still uh, possible to submit until August 30th, but you won't get that added um, you know, extra quality control of me going over your application and ensuring that everything is submitted correctly. So if you would like um, that uh, assurance, I highly recommend submitting by August 16th at 3 p.m. All of our application times, uh, both opening and closing is uh, 3 p.m. So our deadline for the application, the final deadline is August 30th at 3 p.m. So things to know before you apply. Uh, if your program requires approval to contract from a coordinating authority, um, of course, you should inform the authority of the terms and conditions contained in this grant agreement. Uh, applicants must agree to the terms and conditions before receiving funds. HCI will not make changes to the terms and conditions specified in the grant agreement. Uh, definitely want to emphasize that. Uh, funding shall be used to expand primary care services and the funds shall not supplant existing state or local funds to provide primary care services. Um, so uh, that's 
something just to keep in mind. Uh, this is not a, uh, a co contract that can be negotiated. Uh, it's essentially you, you have you know freedom to look over the contract, but you will have to accept it, accept the terms as written. There have been some changes made for uh, for this application year. Uh, as mentioned before, we have new funding opportunities for midwifery programs, uh, certified nursing midwifery programs, as well as licensed midwifery programs. So we're very excited to offer these now. Uh, and for now, these will be folded under the FNPPA application process. So um, the requirements for licensed midwifery and certified nursing midwifery programs will be essentially the same as the FNP and PA program. Um, there are some changes to our scoring criteria. Uh, and you can find those changes uh, throughout the grant guide and uh, throughout this uh, technical assistance guide. Uh, we're increasing the number of students supported by uh, by these programs, um, and we're also now requesting training site payer mix information, which we'll get more into in this presentation, uh, and reducing the types of training sites accepted. Uh, right now, we have up to 3,900,000 in funding available for FNP and PA programs and up to 1 million in funding for certified nursing midwifery and licensed midwifery programs. And uh, as I'm sure you know, we've had a, a organization name change. We're no longer OSHPED and we're now HKI. So with that, we have a new Song Brown staff email address, songbrown at hki.ca.gov. Uh, OK, so some information you'll have to gather for the application. Um, your grant agreement and pay data record, or otherwise known as the STD-204 uh, signatories. Um, the name and full address of all of your training sites used in the last academic year. Uh, and you do not uh, need to include specialty or elective rotation in sites, or you should not include those sites. Uh, facility type for each training site and race and ethnicity data for all current students and high school information um, for the students, such as the name and address of the schools for all current students. Further, uh, you'll need the current practice site information for all graduates entered, um, the national provider identification number or NPI number for all graduates entered, uh, and that's only for graduate data. It's not necessary for student data. And uh, the applicable required uh, attachments, which would be your approval letters or your accreditation letters. So for instance, the program approval letter from the California Board of Registered Nursing, uh, the Accreditation Review Commission on Education for Physician Assistants, um, for uh, I think for CNM programs, the Accreditation Commission on Midwifery Education, and then for LM programs, the Midwifery Education and Accreditation Council accreditation letter. Um, feel free to inquire further about the, the proper accreditation or approval letters, but I believe, uh, I assume many of you know already, uh, based on what your program is, what the appropriate approval or accreditation uh, information is that you'll have to provide. All right, so um, next we'll talk about um, the e-application or e-app registration. So this is how you start your application. Um, first, when you're on the HKI uh, website, you will go to the top left right here where it says create account if you don't already have one. If you do, uh, then you would just go into sign it. So system requirements um, for the best experience, we uh, recommend using Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge uh, browsers. Internet Explorer is not supported, so if you do generally use Internet Explorer, I would recommend uh, downloading one of those two uh, Internet browsers mentioned earlier. Now, once you've uh, clicked on setting up a new profile, you'll come to this box here on the left. Um, and you'll check organization uh, box right here. So uh, just want to really emphasize that uh, even if you are a healthcare professional or a student or what have you, you're registering on behalf of your organization. So um, it could create uh, a lot of issues with the application if one of these are checked. So uh, definitely make sure you check the organization box here. Uh, and that will give you access to the FNPPA applications. 
Uh, then if uh, to set up a new organization, uh, request a new organization, or I'm sorry, for a pre-existing organization, you'll click on the magnifying glass. Uh, if either if you've done an application uh, with your organization for an FNPPA application or for another application, if your organization has been registered within our system, it should be there uh, and you will not need to create a new title. So first, I recommend looking to see if it's already been entered. Uh, if you are not able to find it, then you can click down here where it says request a new organizations. Most organizations are in the system, so um, we highly recommend searching first uh, to see if it's already there, which will then auto populate a lot of fields. So that will be a lot easier for you. OK, so if you're adding a new organization, um, as I said before, you would click the, the bottom button uh, and you'll come with you'll come upon this window. So you would type in your organization name and then you would select this box here to add your address and then a new window will uh, pop up where you uh, enter the uh, your address and it will find it in the system. Uh, you're not able to manually enter your address, so you'll have to do it through what's known as geo and it will um, auto populate based on your uh, input. It can be somewhat um, finicky, so I recommend being careful with punctuation used, um, making sure that you have the name you know, written precisely, and uh, it can also have some issues if there's a lot of people in the application at the same time and may get stuck on the val validating section. So if that happens, all you need to do is close the window, refresh the page, and uh, usually it'll, it'll work after that. So uh, once you're, you put your address in and then it confirms it with GEO, then it will auto populate into this field and then you can click on submit. Uh, Song Brown staff will then review the new organization request within five business days and during this time you can still begin the application even uh, while we're reviewing it. OK, so uh, then you'll come upon this screen after that information is filled out and um, it'll say your email requires confirmation. So you'll just click right here, confirm email to uh, validate your email address for your EAP account. Uh, and then uh, to set up your profile after this, you just click right here where it says profile. All right, so now that you're setting up your profile, you'll just go through all of the uh, empty fields and fill these out. And once you've finished all of this, just click on save. Uh, if there are no errors on the page, you'll receive a message that will say your profile has been updated successfully. Make sure you uh, fill out every box and don't have any uh, incorrect information because that could delay your registration. All right, so um, then you'll be sent an email um, confirming that your account has been set up and that you validated your uh, eApp account. And uh, everyone will be automatically flagged as a grant preparer when they set this up. So uh, if you are a program director, uh, you'll have to email us to request your account permissions be upgraded. So um, yeah, just email us at that same email address I mentioned before, songbrown at hki.ca.gov, and just let them know that you're the program director and we will update your permissions. Um, this is important because only accounts with the program director um, role and permissions can initiate and submit applications. Uh, so then once Song Brown staff approves your request, you'll receive a follow up email confirming your approval that uh, you've been upgraded to program directors. This is something else I would like to really emphasize. Um, you're more than welcome to have grant preparers uh, fill out your application once the program director initiates it, but uh, grant preparers are not able to initiate an application themselves. So the program director will have to start the application then a grant preparer or multiple grant preparers can edit the application. And then once it's time to submit, the program director will have to be logged in and to do that themselves. 
So uh, as I was mentioning before about um, having grant preparers, you're able to assign other users as well to work on the application. So uh, once you're confirmed as a program director, you'll have an additional tab on your interface um, that is right up here and it says uh, add user. And uh, navigating to this page from your profile page allows you to add users who can view and edit the application. So uh, yeah, adding grant preparers basically. And then, uh, yeah, you click on that and then uh, you can give grant preparers access to your applications. Uh, this is also very important to note. You're not able to add a grant preparer until they've already set up uh, an, a profile of their own. So um, what you can do is you can start your application um, and then have all of your grant preparers set up a profile. Then once they set up a profile, then you can go up here add the user, uh, search their name, and then add them, and they'll be added to the grant preparer list for your application. And they should then have access to your application once it's been created. OK, so now that we've done all that, we can begin applying. So you'll click apply here, and then you'll have this list of applications and we are doing the song brown family nurse practitioner slash physicians assistant 2022 application i just want to emphasize even if you're a licensed midwifery or a certified nurse midwifery program you will be clicking this as well because all of uh, all of those programs are going to be held within this application process for this year all right, here's some helpful helpful tips for getting you through the application. Uh, on every page, you'll see at the bottom these two buttons for previous, save, and next. Uh, if you would like to do can work on your application over multiple sessions, you're more than welcome to do that. Just make sure you click save and next after you've put information on that page. If you click previous before you have uh, click save and next, it will not save anything that you've added to that page. So uh, just really want to emphasize if there's something you need to go back and look, you um, there are times in the application process where you'll need to verify data with previous pages. I highly recommend once you finish that page, clicking save and next, even if you haven't finished it, uh, if you're able to click save and next and it allows you to move forward to do so, and then go back because otherwise that data that you've entered so far will not be saved. And then, yeah, if you, if you save your application and like to come back to it later, all you need to do is go back to your profile and then uh, go to the uh, applications in progress slash submitted tab, and it'll show your application that's in progress. And then you just click on uh, this, uh, applicate, this uh, grant number right here. It'll be highlighted in blue and you'll be able to click there and you'll be able to access your application that's in progress. Some other uh, key uh, symbols to look out for, asterisks. Uh, when you see an asterisk on the application page, that means that this is a required field that needs to be filled out. When you see uh, this icon, which is a blue circle with the question mark, that is a tooltip. And what you can do is click on that, and that will give you more information about that specific field. So let's say you don't know what it exactly it means to be a contract administrator, then you click on here and it'll say, oh, this is, oh, excuse me, it'll say this is the last name of the primary contact at the contract organization. There are a lot of tooltips throughout the application, so if you're ever in doubt about what you're supposed to be inputting in a field, look for that tooltip and click on it for more information. All right, so now we're starting the application and uh, you'll come upon this page first and your organization uh, will be auto populated. So that's why it's important that you fill that out earlier when you're setting up your profile. The organization name is the applicant's organization uh, as listed on your eApp profile. Uh, you cannot change your organization name in the application. Um, so you'll have to go to your the applicant's profile, your profile to change your organization name if you've entered it incorrectly. And then uh, now you'll select the program type you want to apply for. Um, so we have uh, family nurse practitioners, physician's assistant, 
combined family nurse practitioner and physician's assistant. And uh, now we have additionally licensed midwifery and certified nurse midwifery. So you'll be selecting one of those five options. Uh, and then you'll also click on the training program below here. So uh, training program title is the official name of the school's training program and will be listed on your grant agreement. So you'll uh, select an existing training program title if it's already been entered by clicking on the magnifying glass here. Uh, so if you've done an application before, uh, the previous year, something like that, uh, then your training program will be in our system. Please do not try to enter it again. If you've already uh, done this before, um, you would definitely want to click on that magnifying glass because what that will do is it will transfer all of your previous data from your, the previous year onto this application and it will save you a lot of work. So if you have applied before and you set up your training program before, make sure you click on this magnifying glass and then find your training program name in our, in our system. If you're not able to find it, feel free to email me and I can help you find it. Maybe it was titled something slightly different than you're expecting, but if you say it's not listed and you enter a new one, then none of your data from previous years will be carried over. So again, like organization names, most training programs are going to be in the system, so try to search for it first before uh, before typing in a new one. All right, so if you selected training program not listed, if it's a completely new training program, then you'll have this new field appear. And you'll type in the program name under training program title, and the name must list the school followed by the program type acronym. Uh, for example, the University of the West, comma, FNP program. So you'll want to say the exact kind of program you're applying for. Uh, then you'll click on the select address button, which will be uh, just like the organization uh, population fields. You'll type in search your address and then it'll come up with uh, options uh, and then you can click on that and it will verify the address in geo and then it'll let you know when it's verified and you can close and it'll have filled out all the rest of the information. All right, now we come to the next page, uh, contract administration. So before completing this page, you have to verify the information with your contracts or finance office to ensure accuracy. Uh, in, in, incorrect information could delay an agreement, so this is another really important field to make sure you get correctly. Uh, so you enter the contract organization name, and this will be the official business name as reported to the IRS and will be included in the agreement. Uh, and you'll enter your grant agreement signatory uh, information as well, right here. And this is the signatory authorized to enter into a grant agreement on behalf of your organization. And you also uh, will enter the STD 204 signatory information. So this is the, the person, the signatory with expertise on tax reporting for your organization. It's possible uh, this could be the same individual uh, who's being the grant agreement signatory and the 204 signatory depends on your organization. So I would uh, make sure that you have that information correct before you put that down. Also, if you uh, conduct business as uh, in a different name than your official IRS organization name, you would fill this in as uh, doing business as and then you would put the uh, the name that you operate under normally. All right, so here's where you would enter the legal address for your organization. This address must match your IRS records, and uh, you'll use the street address lookup uh, if it's a physical address. It also asks if it's a PO box, which uh, if it is, it should be five digits. Um, and then if it isn't yet, yeah, then you would uh, you would enter uh, this field just like the previous ones. And uh, here you also have the field to enter your authorized representative for the payee, and this is the person who's authorized to receive warrants on behalf of the payee. OK, now we get to the program description page. Uh, make sure you complete both of these boxes. 
there's a maximum of 2500 character limit for each question. So if you are filling it out in a Microsoft Word document or, or some other document, which I recommend in case anything happens with the application, it'll be good to have a backup. Uh, make sure that uh, it's less than 2,500 characters. If it's over 2,500 characters, it will only populate the field up to when that character limit is reached. So if you are copying and pasting into one of these boxes, please make sure it didn't cut off uh, your, your answer because uh, then it will be in, an incomplete submission. All right, so uh, now we get to your program data page. The import data option will default to yes. So it, um, if you did apply a previous year, you'll definitely wanna click yes, because uh, this will transfer over all of that data from your previous years. Uh, and then you can uh, use the magnifying glass search function um, on the program information page to select the training program title. Oh, yeah, so that's this is where it takes the information that you submitted earlier from your uh, training site information and program information, and this is where it carries that over here. If you did not apply last year, you'll select no in this field right here, and that will not carry any data over, and you'll have to enter all new information. And uh, you'll have to also make sure you select the correct field here. If you have both student and data, uh, student and graduate data, or if you only have student data, if you uh, maybe you're a newer program, you don't have graduate data yet, or you're a brand new program and there's no student or graduate data. And then uh, you'll scroll down the program data page and you'll come to uh, these fields. And this is where you enter um, the, your total enrollment capacity, first year slots available, and this will be for um, last year and the previous year. Uh, and the number of students and graduates you enter here for students enrolled, second year graduates, must match the corresponding number you enter in the student data and graduate data pages, which come later. So these fields are very important. Uh, if they are inaccurate and they don't match the pages that are to come, you won't be able to uh, move forward. So make sure that uh, you, you get the correct information for the students enrolled and second year graduates. And then uh, make sure I, I would make note of it on this page so that you don't have to keep going back and forth. And then once you're at the student page and graduate data page pages, you'll see those fields are relevant again, and you can verify that they're the same. So then you'll click save and next. Now we move on to training sites. So uh, if you do have uh, data from previous year, then it will import all of your data here into the training sites with error section. Uh, so that happens automatically because we wanna make sure that you're verifying each of your training sites. So uh, doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the data necessarily, but it will automatically populate here. And all you'll need to do is go to this uh, arrow dropdown, click on edit, and then verify that all the data for all of the training site fields is accurate. Uh, and then once you do so, um, you'll it'll save and you'll verify it and it'll show up under this field next, which I'll show you the following pages. So uh, to add a new site, you'll click here at the top, add a site, uh, and that'll add a new training site. And then you'll have this new window open where you can enter the training site name, um, enter uh, the, if there's a private practitioner, you'll enter their information, you enter the training site's uh, street address. You also have facility types that you'll have to fill out. Uh, for each site, you have to identify the facility type. This is very important for, for scoring your application. If you're uncertain uh, what your facility is, what the exact facility type is then you can click on this drop down for more information and that will have a number of links to uh, to follow through on and and see if that matches with the type of facility that that you believe you have we also have these tool tips for each facility type that you can click on and that will get you more information as to what constitutes that specific facility type um, and yeah you'll just have to verify that uh, 
your facility matches one of those. Uh, facility types can include community health centers, disproportionate share hospital, uh, FQHCs, FQHC lookalikes, government owned facilities, Indian health services clinics, rural hospitals, and teaching hospitals. And then you get to the payer mix section of the application, and you'll have to enter the payer mix for each site for the time frame listed in the application. So this shows June 2021 to June 2022. Uh, the payer mix doesn't have to equal uh, 100 across all fields, but it can't be above 100%. Um, so th you know, this will be how many uh, the percent of your work that includes Medicare, Medicaid um, part, uh, clients or patients, Medi-Cal patients and uninsured patients. And then once all of this is verified, you would click on training site reviewed. Uh, yes, and then uh, then it'll move into the uh, down in the training site field with no errors. So for instance, if you have a previous site that you're verifying, you would go through all of this and assuming everything is correct, you would just click training site reviewed and it'll move from the error section to the section with no errors. All right, so now uh, we're in the program funding and expenditures section and you will enter uh, the academic year 2021-2022 training program annual expenditures uh, so this is your breakdown of of you know what your expenses are as they relate to this grant uh, if you're unsure of each field and where you should put your expenditures we have these tool tips here that will give more information as to what um, what that field relates to so uh, you have to enter your exact uh, and actual budget figures in these fields, so they can't be a, you know an estimate; it has to be the exact number. And the total that will get calculated right here uh, must be equal to or greater than the max funding amount for your program. So make sure that uh, that 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 matches this max funding based on your currently enrolled students. So if you up, have up to 50 students, it'll be 144, 50 to 75, it'll be 168,000 and so on. So after you've verified all of this and completed this page, click Save and Next. Now we're on the student data page. So uh, assuming you did have student data from the previous year, you can review the imported student data. Just like with the training site information, it automatically moves to the error list and you'll have to click here and uh, click edit and then just go through all of the fields and make sure they're correct. And then uh, at the bottom, it'll say student data reviewed. You'll click yes and then once it is, then it'll move down here to the students with no errors. Uh, yeah. I think that's that's it. Oh, uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, NPI numbers and practice specialty are optional for students. Um, they are required for the graduate data page, though. So ensure only valid information in, information is listed and errors are resolved before moving on. Records on the error list after the application submission may not be considered for scoring. So uh, if you don't verify all the information that gets imported here and it moves to the green, that says that it's been reviewed and there's no errors, then that data will not get counted towards your scoring. So that's very important that if you want this data to be uh, to be counted in your in the scoring criteria, it will have to be reviewed and will have to be in this section of students with no errors. All right, so if you're adding new students, then you would click this button at the top, add a student. And a new window will pop up, and this is where you will complete all of the information for your new students. So you put the graduating class, what year they're graduating, their, all of this information. Uh, you'll have to include their high school name. Uh, if it's not applicable, you would click here, for instance, if they're homeschooled or if it's uh, out of state. Um, but I believe even out of state, you can click this information. So I think it's only if it's homeschooled that you would click this uh, this button. All 
All right, so uh, let's say you've submitted, uh, you've filled all your fields out, and now they've moved down to the students with no errors, and it's in the green. Uh, you can review, edit, or delete uh, any students on your list, either from here or from the students with errors section. Uh, and again, you just click on this arrow button. That's where you both edit information, or if you'd like to delete a, an entry, you can delete it there. So once you've verified all of your student data, you will click Save and Next. Uh, just to note, you have to ensure only valid student information is listed and all data issues are resolved. As stated before, if anything's left on the error list after submitting, they will not be considered for scoring. So now we move on to the graduate data page, which is uh, very similar to the student data page. Uh, things, all of your imported entries will show up in this error list in red. You will click this error dropdown go and click on edit, and then you'll see that uh, that field populate, and you just need to verify all that information is entered correctly. And if so, then you would just click yes at the bottom, and uh, and it'll move down to this field in green. You have to include all uh, academic year 2019 to 2020 and 2020 to 21 graduates in your application if you uh, did practice in those years or if you were operational in those years. So if you selected yes to import the prior year's data on the program data page, then um, it'll import all of your graduate data. Uh, yeah, I believe that's everything. Uh, and as I said before, with the graduate data, you will need to enter the NPI information, which is not required for student data. So if you're adding new graduates, you would click uh, this box right here, add a graduate, and then this window will populate um, and you fill that out. I th yeah, I, we think we've covered this, so if you need to edit anything, you just click on this. And uh, yeah, let's move on to the next page. All right, so uh, practice site information. Uh, this is within the graduate graduate data information. Uh, you have to add the practice site for all graduates. Uh, so as you can see, that has an asterisk, so this is a required field. If your graduate is working in California and you know their practice site, then you will select yes. Uh, and then you will enter the practice site name. If the practice site is not listed, uh, so if it doesn't populate, then you would click practice site not listed and enter the practice site name. For each site, you must identify the facility type. This is very important because it uh, affects your scoring criteria. So please verify your facility types using the links under more information, as stated before with your uh, training sites. It'll be the same, same type of deal. Um, and yeah, uh, as stated, you will need the MPI number and the practice specialty of the graduates. If there are out of state graduates, if your graduate is working outside of California, then you would just select no. Um, even if you do know their practice site, there's not a, a function to enter it if it's out of out of state. And you would just select uh, out of state in this drop down. Under uh, yeah, reason practice site is unknown. <clears throat> OK, so just wanted to go through some common application errors so that uh, if you know these issues come up, you'll know what to do. So uh, a lot of issues um, that come up are, for instance, having the incorrect signatory. So providing uh, the incorrect name of the signatory for the grant agreement or for the STD 204 payee data record. Make sure you verify with uh, your finance department or contracts office before submitting the application to ensure that this information is correct or it could delay uh, your agreement. If there are any incorrect or missing required documents, that could be a major issue, so please ensure you have attached all required documents. If you fail to attach in all required documents or submit incorrect documents, it could cause uh, your application to be ineligible. Uh, entering the wrong facility type. Please ensure you verify the correct facility type using the links in the application. Incorrect facility types may impact your scoring. Or if you have outdated uh, remit to address, which is um, basically your uh, your uh, IRS address, 
verify with your finance office that there has been no change to the remit to address. This is uh, the address in which your uh, grant payments will be sent to via check. If there is an outdated address, you may experience lost or delayed payments. So your uh, remit to address is uh, very important to make sure that's accurate. Uh, having the wrong program training program name. If you entered a new training program title for an existing program, uh, that could create a big problem. The proper course of action is to use the search function, uh, that little magnifying glass that we spoke about earlier, to select the exact training program title used in the prior application, or the data import feature won't work. If you're having issues finding your training program, please contact us uh, and we will help you find uh, find your previous training program. Uh, if there's any missing data, uh, that could be a big issue. So if you did not include all of your training sites, all of your student and graduate data, um, if your data uh, import isn't verified, for instance, if you uh, if it stays on the error list or if you haven't entered any new data, that could be an issue because as I said earlier, if your data isn't verified, it won't get counted towards scoring criteria. And then if there's any inconsistency with your data, so if your data that you've entered is inconsistent with the previous application, uh, that could cause a, a delay. So please ensure that um, your reporting method is consistent with previous years. Uh, you can do this by comparing the, your current application with your prior year's application to make sure that all of the data is consistent. OK, so now we get to the required document submission page. Uh, this is, uh, as I stated before, if you have um, an approval letter or an accreditation letter for your program, this is where that would go. The red button on this page indicates this is what's required. Um, and once you've uploaded all required documents, the button will turn green, signifying that you may continue. So ensure your document upload is titled correctly. All documents uploaded to this will have to be titled a a p p r underscore and then you can um, you know finish it with whatever your accreditation or approval letter is is called um, this is very important if your document is not titled uh, this to begin with a p r a p p r underscore um, and then you know finishing it with whatever the the proper name is uh, it will not submit correctly uh, the only difference in uh, program types is if you are a combined FNPPA program, you will have to submit two documents for your approval letter or accreditation letter because you'll need uh, your proper approval letter for each uh, program, the FNP and PA component. So FNPPA combined programs need to submit two documents. Every other program just submits one. And then you also have the option to submit um, other supporting documents in the corresponding correspondence field, but this is not required. So once your approval letter is submitted and uh, it's in the correct format, here it says APPR underscore and it says test doc. So whatever the, you know, the remainder of the name is, is up to you. Uh, once that's verified, this will turn from red to green. Um, all files that are required have been submitted and you can click save and next. Oh, if you need to delete and upload a document, if you've uploaded an incorrect document, you can just click on this arrow right here, and then this is where you would click delete. So you submit the wrong thing, you can just uh, delete it and then go back here and upload your letter. So this is the final page of the application, the assurances page. So please read the certify statement. Uh, agree to the statement by checking I certify right here, and then uh, you will click the submit button. This is uh, very important that you do not click this until you're absolutely sure that you've filled every previous page correctly, because once you submit this, there's no editing and there's no going back. Um, of course, uh, with the exception of if you submit it before August 16th, then we will review it and let you know if there's any errors but uh, you won't be able to edit this document uh, after you click submit beyond that. Uh, as I said before, only the program director can submit an application. If you are a grant preparer, 
you do not have the ability to submit an application. So you can get as far as this step in the application process and you won't be able to complete it. Only the program director is able to complete your application and submit it. And then uh, if everything works out, you'll get this uh, this message right here saying thank you for submitting your application. Um, and then once you have submitted it, you can go to your dashboard and it'll show your application uh, is in there. You won't be able to edit it anymore, but you can verify that it has been submitted. And then if you'd like to uh, have a, you know, a hard copy record or even a PDF, you can uh, view your application by uh, going back to your applications uh, in progress or submitted tab. This is where this will show up. And as I said before, this will no longer be blue. It'll be uh, it'll be blacked out and you won't be able to edit it anymore. But you can click this drop down and you can view your application or print it. Um, and you can keep that for your records. OK, so um, now moving on from the application process to discuss the DocuSign process. So the uh, DocuSign is uh, how you'll be um, filling out your uh, grant agreement. Um, it, it's uh, the next step after you submit your application. You'll uh, once everything's approved, then uh, you'll have to have all the relevant parties, the uh, grantee and the STD 204 payee will have to sign uh, the completed grant agreement through DocuSign. So you have to confirm your signatories with your contracting office before submitting application to avoid delays with agreement execution. So make sure you have the correct signatories listed in your grant agreement in the application. Agreements will be routed for signature through DocuSign email based on the grant agreement signatory and payee data record 204 contacts provided in the application. So again, if this information was inputted incorrectly, uh, then uh, it will have the wrong uh, wrong people attached to this each step of the DocuSign process. So it's very important that you verify that. DocuSign emails must be sent directly to the agreement signatory and payee data signatory email addresses. So th these are the email addresses of the specific individuals responsible for those positions. So for instance, Jane Smith at ucx.edu. Please do not provide a shared email address such as provost at ucx.edu or contracts at ucx.edu. This uh, can often create issues in the DocuSign process and uh, it just it creates a lot of technical problems and it will could likely delay uh, receipt of the grant. So we highly recommend using the specific and exact email address of the individual responsible for that position. Um, if you don't see the DocuSign in your email, please make sure you check your spam or junk folder uh, as some systems flag DocuSign emails as spam. Signatories cannot edit any documents in DocuSign. They can only sign off on them. No edits are allowed to the grant agreements. So as stated earlier, these are not uh, negotiable contracts. Uh, these will have to be accepted as is. To receive the grant, you have to accept all agreements, all agreement terms as provided. So each signatory, as designated in the application, will receive a DocuSign email specific to their role. Um, these are you know, usually done in a certain order, so uh, you may not receive it at the same time. Um, and that's not necessarily a problem. Um, so certain individuals will receive it first before it can move on to the next individual who's responsible. Only the designated signatory can open a DocuSign email, otherwise the link uh, won't work. Uh, no one can be CC'd on the DocuSign emails. However, designated signatories can download a copy of what they sign. Your DocuSign links will expire within 30 days, so please review the agreement template in your grant guide on the Song Brown webpage before receiving the DocuSign to expedite your review and signing process. Uh, I would like to emphasize the 30 days includes every person in the process who has to sign this, so that's the individuals within HCI who need to sign as well as the individuals within your program who need to sign. It's not 30 days per individual, so um, please check the date that the DocuSign started 
And please sign as soon as possible, because if you're not able to sign within the 30 days, we will have to send out the DocuSign again, start the process again, and that could delay the grant execution. OK, I know that was a lot of information to take in, but uh, we're here to answer uh, any questions you have and uh, looking forward to working with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. For everyone's reference, the slide deck is posted on our website on the Song Brown page. Please feel free to continue to place questions in the chat. Also, you may raise the hand icon for questions too. You will find the hand icon on the top of your screen with the reactions button. Once you raise your hand, I'll call on you. Your mic will be enabled and you will need to unmute yourself. To unmute yourself, your mic, the mic button is at the top of the screen. Please mute yourselves after speaking and lower your hand icon. Feel free to continue to place questions in the chat. We will do our best to answer all your questions. I'm going to turn it over to Crystal right now for a couple comments, please. Um, actually, I, I can I can answer uh, those those questions. Um, so yeah, reviewing the questions in the chat, uh, one of them was: Is the 3.9 million per grant? Um, or is it the total funds across all grants? Uh, no, the 3.9 million is the total available across the entire FNP PA program, not per grant. And the 1 million is across all midwifery programs, both certified nurse midwifery and licensed midwifery. Another question was, if multiple grads or students work at the same site, will this count once or can it count multiple times since it's two different individuals? So one record should be entered on the training site per page. Uh, for each physical address of a training site, regardless of how many students or graduates use that site. Um, you, you will not enter multiple records for each uh, suite or department number, only one record uh, per physical site. Uh, and as for the graduate data page, there will only be one record for each graduate, so you enter one practice site per graduate. And uh, the third question, of, oh, program data page. Uh, oh, right. So um, we wanted to add one clarification I forgot to mention, um, and this is in, in progress of getting changed, but on the bottom of the program data page, uh, it asks how many grads have passed a national exam. Um, and it, I think it says an uh, NCLEX national exam. So uh, that, that NCLEX part is only relevant to, uh, it's actually not relevant to the students. So it's just any national exam. Um, for F and PPAs or um, uh, certified nurse midwifery or licensed midwifery. So um, ignore the NCLEX part, just um, it's the question is how many people have passed the national exam relevant to your program? And yeah, we're, we're working on removing that uh, that today. So um, so yeah, please don't get discouraged by that. Uh, and fourth, the program budget and expenditure page. Um, Make sure you're reporting your actual training program budget for the prior year. We've seen in the past programs uh, breaking down the award amount requested as it's listed on this page under the fields on this page rather than actual expenditures for the prior, prior year. If you've completed this page correctly, your actual program budget for the prior year will be greater than the award amount. Excuse me, David, I see some hands raised. I'm going to turn to that for right now, then we can go back from chat. Sure. Okay, Lucy Huckabee, if you could please unmute yourself. Um, hi, this is Alice. I'm here with Dr. Huckabee from Cal State Long Beach. Um, if you guys can please clarify the number entered into students enrolled under program data. Um, I believe you said that this number has to be the same as what's entered later on for student data. But those years are for 22, I think, and it goes up to 23, 24. So I'm not sure if I'm missing something, but how, how will that number be the same as 2019, 20, and 21 that's asking in the program data? Uh, you know what? I'll pass this off to uh, my manager, Melissa. Uh, I think she'll have a, a, a better answer than I could give. Hello. Hi, Dr. Huckabee. Uh, Hi. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> um, so the students enrolled on the program data page, if you're filling out those numbers um, for the graduate years, those 
numbers um, wouldn't obviously, right, wouldn't be the same as the numbers for your current students. I don't know if there's a pay, uh, a place on the program data page. Can you pull that page up, David, that talks about your currently enrolled students anywhere? Or if we ask a question about how many currently enrolled students do you have, that is um, what if we have that question, then it's that number, your response there should match the number of students that you enter into the application on the um, student data page. But I'm not sure if we have a field on the program data page that asks about your currently enrolled students. Do you see that, David? <clears throat> Sorry, I was trying to access my mic. Uh, could you ask, could you say that again, Melissa? Do we have a place on the program data page where we ask the number of currently enrolled students? Uh, yes, yes. OK. Yes. Not for the graduate years that are listed right. in that table, but just somewhere else. Do we ask for that? Uh, we have students enrolled right here in the program data page. So Can it, you? And it has for, yeah, it's right here. But is it tied to one of the grad the prior graduate years? It's tied to the student data page. This is tied to the graduate data page. That, that's correct, right? Yeah. So the students enrolled for these two years, um, that corresponds with the students listed on the student data page. The second year graduates, when you fill out those two years, that corresponds with the graduate data page. OK, so is there any way you can sh pull that up and show that to everyone? Yeah. <laughs> I think the confusion is that it's showing, uh, we, we thought it, it's asking for 2019, 20, 20 and 21 for students enrolled on the program data page, but it's asking for different years on the student data page for 22, 23, 24. Right, right. That's right. why I'm, I'm hope. Okay. Melissa? Melissa? Yes. yes. Um, remember on the student data page, it's the anticipated graduation year. It's slightly worded different. That's why you're seeing different years. OK, well, I'm not seeing anything because nothing's being. Can you go to that page in the TA guide, David? The program data page so sure. we can see what the questions are. Mm -hmm. Sorry, screen. Program data page. OK, so here. OK, do you, so you see these years here? No, we don't see anything yet. I still see David. <laughs> OK, yeah, so sorry, it's kind of small, but. Is there any way you can blow it up a little bit? Sorry, it, I just have to keep toggling my mic on and off because there's an echo. Let me just uh, Crystal just going to come speak on here so we don't have to keep doing that. OK, so on this page, you have 1920 and 2021, right? Because we're we're looking at all of these fields, but if you go to the student data page, you'll see that they're they're pushed forward two years, right? Because on that student data page, it reflects anticipated graduation date rather than enrolled date or academic year. Yeah, but this page, this page, the information on this page is looking back, right? Mm -hmm. So we want all of this information on this page to to reflect these classes that happened in the past, correct? Uh, well, if you see these students enrolled, it'll be students enrolled for 2021 and 1920. Right, and then on the student data page, it's going to be the anticipated graduation date, which is two years forward. 
for 22, 23, and 23, 24. So it's just pushing forward two years because the question's asked a little differently. It's asking for, you know, anticipated graduation year here. Right, so this, this will be, so for instance, if they graduate in 2023, um, you would you would put that for instance, um, right? But, but you would put there, but in the previous page where it says program data, you wouldn't you would put the student for the students for the current academic year that like is currently taking classes in that program. So it would be uh, for for 2020 enrolled. and 2021. Yeah, it would be the ones in, enrolled in that program. So this would correspond with uh, assuming they graduate in, I don't know, 2023 or 2022, 2023. You would take this number and then put it on when you get to the student page here. You would just enter those same number of students, but make sure you put their graduating year, not the current year that they're enrolled in. I know that's a little confusing, but um, if you just think about uh, this page is when you're mentioning they're the year they're expected to graduate, right? So if they're, you know, class of 23, that's where this would go. But if you're referring to those same students on the program data page, you just enter the number of students that are enrolled the that year, the year we're talking about in 2022. Okay, so you're saying the numbers are basically, it's referring to the same thing? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I think we got confused because it says enter data in each field for the graduating class for each academic year 2021, not 23, but I understand. Thank you. Um, we were also, I'm sorry, we we're also having some uh, issues with entering the the address for the bar. I think I, I sent an email about this too, and, and we did try to refresh it, but it still doesn't work. Um, and we're not able to manually enter the address. Should we just keep trying and keep Keep yeah. refreshing. Yeah. Um, so I mean that uh, the the way that function works is that um, if there's a lot of people applying at the same time, it can put potentially overload the geo system. So um, that's you're not doing anything wrong. It it happens sometimes. All you really need to do is uh, as as you were trying, you close out of the page, uh, go back a page, and reload the page. Um, and if it's not working after a while, I would just wait a bit. Maybe there's just a, a lot of traffic at that time, and that's what's causing the issue. OK, thank you. Sure. I know we're a little bit over time. Thank you. Nicole has her hand up. Yes, thank you. Sorry, um, Nicole Martinez from UCI. Um, I have a question that may be just unique to our school, but we recently transitioned from the master's program for FNP to a DNP. We have not applied for for this grant for a couple of years because of that transition. Does that put us in the class as a new program completely with a new application because we've received this before, but for our master's program? Uh, so I would ask, time. do you have any, so you have currently enrolled students, correct? Yes. But you have no graduates of this new DNP program. Is that we right? Have one, we have one cohort. That has graduated? Yes, in June. Okay, so are they for any, um, did they graduate in any of the years that we're asking for graduate data? They graduated 21, 22, so no. Okay, so then you would be a new program with no graduates to report. Okay. So does that, so we would not be able to provide any graduate data at all then? Correct, but okay. new programs with no graduate data to report receive the average. Um, okay. For those programs that do have that data to report. So you're not necessarily at a disadvantage. disadvantage. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay. Thank you. I want to make sure we answered all the questions in the chat. Uh, um, uh, uh, to add on that, I'm also from UCI. This is Scott together. Uh, so I didn't see the option of new program uh, graduating. Uh, the options were like student and graduating data, student data only, or new program with no student or graduating data. 
So which right. option do we select? Right. So you're going to all you have to provide is student data. So that's what you're going to click on that page is student data only. Right. Got it. So, yeah. So you Thank have you. student data only to provide. All right. Thank you. I know we've run over time a little bit. Any questions that we haven't answered that are in the chat? Go ahead, keep putting them in there, and we will get to you. Uh, we will get to you soon once this webinar is closed. I'm just going to turn it back to David for any closing remarks. And thank you very much for your time, everyone. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Michelle, and and thank you for all your questions. Um, for anything that we haven't gotten to, um, f please feel free to to email us, and we will uh, happily cover any other questions you have about the application process or um, anything else that that remains unsaid. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I really hope to uh, develop a you know personal relationship with each and every one of you. Uh, I'm going to be your grants officer, so. I'd be more than happy to talk with you one on one about any issues you have and work you walk you through this process. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, looking forward to working with you all. So uh, again, please feel free to email us with any questions. Um, I'll go back to that email address again just to make sure everybody has it. Uh, here, songbrown at hki.ca.gov. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, make sure you include uh, your application number and program name just just for ease. Um, but yeah, looking forward to again um, helping you all through this process and uh, and working with you all. So thank you so much for signing on today. Thank you, David. One more thing: the recording will be available on our our website on the Song Brown page. Great. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, we'll close it out there. Thank you again. Bye, everyone.